Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's national webinar presented by SAMHSA's Game Center with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Today's webinar is titled Supporting Veterans in Criminal Justice System Part 2. Co uh, this webinar is focused on responding to co-occurring PTSD and substance use disorder. Our presenters today are Dr. Matthew Stimmel and Dr. Kathleen Chard, and I will introduce them shortly. But first, I've got a couple of housekeeping items to review. First, I'm Dr. Melissa Stein, a Senior Research Associate at Policy Research Associates and SAMHSA's Gain Center. And uh, I'm joining from the Charlotte, North Carolina area. Uh, you should see a chat uh, icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, I welcome you to add your name and where you're joining from. And before I start our presentations, I've got just a couple of things to cover. First, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Use Treatment, the Substance Use and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We do have a Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen, and throughout the presentations, we welcome your questions in regards to the presentations or in regards to technology. Uh, and at the conclusion of the presentations, we will cover as many questions as time permits. We'll also be conducting a couple of polls throughout the event and appreciate your participation. When you see a poll pop up, please select and submit your responses. And you should have just seen a poll pop up right now. The webinar is being recorded and we will disseminate slides to everyone who is registered for this event. We'll also notify you when the recording is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. A certificate of attendance will be available for download at the end of today's presentation. And please note that this certificate is for your personal portfolio use only. We are not able to offer it to you credits. We will have ASL interpretation for our presentation today. Our interpreters today are Ginger Fairbanks and Pam Bohr. We also have live captioning for today's event. To view live captioning, click Live Transcript CC, then select Show Subtitles. Just a quick look at our agenda today. Coming up next, we have John Berg providing some opening remarks on behalf of SAMHSA. You'll be followed by a presentation from our from today's speakers. But now I'd like to turn it over to John Berg, who is a senior public health advisor at the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA for his opening remarks. John. Thank you, Dr. Stein. I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar part two of supporting veterans in the criminal justice system responding to co-occurring PTSD and SUD. Thank you for attending today. SAMHSA is pleased to provide this webinar that will focus on serving veterans in veterans treatment courts and other adult specialty courts that provide services to veterans. I want to mention again how much we appreciate the opportunity to partner with our long-standing veterans affairs expert, Sean Clark, the National Director for Veterans Justice Programs at the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and his VA colleagues, Catherine Andrada and Brian Kurtz, both VJAOs, VJAO specialists. I would also like to thank all of you who are attending today that are veterans. Thank you for your service. And thank you to those that aren't veterans but made it a priority today to attend to learn how to better serve our veterans. SAMHSA believes that veterans treatment courts are an important resource for communities to assist justice involved veterans and divert them away from incarceration and into treatment. Veterans treatment courts connect these men and women to the benefits and treatment they have earned. SAMHSA also encourages all of our funded adult treatment drug courts, family treatment drug courts, and tribal healing wellness courts to address the behavioral health needs of active duty military service members, returning veterans, and military families in designing and developing their programs and to consider prioritiz prioritizing this population for services where appropriate. This proactive approach is accomplished by effectively targeting and addressing veteran 
participants' clinical needs, including medical, behavioral health, and trauma. SAMHSA is supportive of veterans' treatment courts and provides funding for them through grants and with training and technical assistance to the field through SAMHSA's Gain Center, through webinars like this, and through other uh, resources. Post-traumatic stress disorder and substance use disorder are often co-occurring within the veteran population. Up to 75% of veterans with the SUD also have PTSD, and 20 to 30% of veterans with PTSD have a comorbid SUD. To reduce the risk of recidivism and to support long-term recovery and justice-involved veterans, it is crucial that treatment courts know how to identify and respond to their unique needs. During today's webinar, our presenters will describe the prevalence of co-occurring PTSD and SUD among the veteran population, share the VA's approach and services for treating PTSD and SUD among veterans, and describe ways treatment courts can leverage treatment and services available through the VA for their veteran population. I want to thank our presenters, Dr. Matthew Stimmel and Dr. Kate Shard, for taking time today to share their knowledge and expertise with us. And as always, I want to thank the Gain Center and their staff for their work in developing and facilitating today's webinar. So at this time, I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Stein. Thank you so much, John. And now I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. Dr. Matthew Stimmel is the National Training Director for the Veterans Justice Programs, or VJP, within the Veterans Health Administration Homeless Programs Office. Dr. Stimmel is responsible for developing and sustaining the education and training of over 400 VJP staff contributing to national policy on justice-involved veterans and cultivating operational partnerships that advance BJP's mission of ensuring access and care to justice-involved veterans and reducing their risk of recidivism and homelessness. He is also a clinical assistant professor at the Stanford University School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Simmel has been with the VA since 2013, completing a postdoctoral fellowship in trauma at the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System, and then working as a clinical psychologist slash veterans out justice outreach specialist in 2014, where he helped to establish several veterans treatment courts in California. He has received his PhD in clinical psychology from Fordham University with a specialization in coordinate psychology. Dr. Kathleen Chard is the Associate Chief of Staff for Research and Director of Trauma Recovery Center at the Cincinnati VA Medical Center. She is also a Professor of Clinical Psychiatry and Director of the UC Health Stress Center at the University of Cincinnati. Dr. Chard is an international expert on the assessment and treatment of stress-related disorders, including PTSD. She is a co-author of the Cognitive Processing Therapy PTSD Treatment Manual, and she has received extensive funding to examine stress epidemiology, assessment and treatment in veterans, first responders, and civilians. She frequently provides training on the causes of stress, stress management, and the treatment of PTSD. So you have heard who all is um, presenting with you today, and now we'll take a quick look at who all is joining us for today's presentations. And in addition to all of you saying hello in the chat, what we see in our poll is that a majority, over half of you are joining from urban locations, followed by a pretty even breakout of participants joining from rural and suburban locations. We've got a handful of people joining from tribal lands, such as reservation, Pueblo, or Alaska Native villages. And then in terms of organizations or agencies, we have a tie between community-based provider agencies and corrections, probation, and parole. So about 22% from each of those agencies. About 17% of you joining from government and policy. We've got a good number of folks joining us from the judiciary and the court systems, uh, as well as a number of you joining from academia and crisis services and hospitals. So thanks so much for joining us today, taking your time to participate in these presentations. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Stimmel. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Stein, and, and hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, really excited to be with you all this afternoon and look forward to speaking 
about how to approach working with veterans with criminal legal involvement who also have PTSD and substance use disorders. Um, just to give you a little bit of an overview of what we'll be talking about today, um, to follow up on what uh, Dr. Berg was describing, I'm going to give a little bit of background information about what we know about these conditions in this population of veterans, some other important risk factors to consider in conjunction with these diagnoses. Then Dr. Shar is going to talk more specifically about treatment, and we'll conclude with some suggestions about some approaches to trauma-informed care in your various justice settings. I'll be focusing a little bit more on courts in that section, though I'll try to sort of discuss how this might show up for jails or prisons or probation as well. Uh, I also just want to start by saying I'm uh, born and raised New Yorker. I tend to talk pretty quickly. Um, sometimes I get a little anxious when presenting, so that can also speed me up. So I have my eye on the chat. If I'm going too fast, please just let me know, and I'll try to slow down for you. Uh, but thanks for bearing with me. Uh, I also want to mention at the top that I won't be going into too much detail about Veterans Justice Programs, which is the program I, I work for at the VA, um, as that was covered in depth by my colleagues, um, Sean Clark and Brian Kurz and Pat Andrade on the previous webinar. Um, but that's available on the YouTube channel, um, as was mentioned, and so really encourage you to, to check that out for a more in-depth dive into what we do in Veterans Justice Programs. So um, PTSD and substance use in veterans served by veterans justice programs. Um, I want to start by highlighting that PTSD itself is a risk factor for criminal legal involvement. A systematic literature review and meta-analysis conducted a couple years ago by our colleagues, Dr. Emmeline Taylor and Andrea Finlay, found that veterans with PTSD had higher odds for arrest and violence-related charges compared to veterans without PTSD. And we know from the work that Dr. Finlay does examining the data specifically from our programs within VA, um, that most veterans we serve have either a mental health disorder, a substance use disorder, or both, and that of those with a mental health diagnosis, 43% are diagnosed with PTSD, and for those with current cohen diagnoses, 28% are diagnosed with PTSD. Um, and that <clears throat> is second only to uh, diagnoses of depression. In addition to mental health and substance use disorder as potential risk factors for criminal legal involvement, there are also some additional key risk factors it's important to assess for and understand while serving veterans in the criminal justice system. These include gender-based risk factors, such as the prevalence of military sexual trauma and overall increased risk for PTSD and other mental health conditions among women veterans. Though I do want to also note that MST is not um, uh, an issue only specific to women veterans. Um, many male veterans also experience MST. And in fact, the greater overall raw number of veterans who experience MST are men. Um, it's just a lower percentage. Um, and it may be actually harder to assess for in treatment court and other correctional settings because of the shame associated with it. But it's an important thing to consider when working with all veterans. We're also long overdue for a very needed understanding of and attention paid towards race-based trauma and stress, especially in the uh, criminal justice system. Uh, unfortunately, similar to the broader incarcerated population, Black, Latinx, and American Indian and Alaska Native veterans are overrepresented within the incarcerated veteran population. And this is consistent with what we also know about veterans uh, who experience homelessness. And it's also worth highlighting um, that approximately 10% of incarcerated veterans have an other than honorable discharge. And that's about five times the overall percentage of veterans with OTH discharges in the community. And, and I bring this up, it's important in terms of access to care, which we'll be talking about when Dr. Char talks about treatment, um, but it's also related to um, uh, race-based traumatic stress and equity issues. Uh, as we know broadly that veterans of color have historically received um, OTH discharges at a higher rate. Um, uh, some studies indicating that black service members were one and a half to two and a half times as likely as their white service member colleagues to receive an OTH discharge, as have LGBTQ plus veterans, um, with over 100,000 LGBTQ plus veterans being discharged with that paper between 1945 and 2011, largely as a result of discriminatory, discriminatory practices like don't ask, don't tell. And finally, stigmatization is a huge issue um, when working with justice-involved individuals, um, including veterans. Um, veterans with criminal legal involvement may face significant stigmatization both in the community and even at the VA itself as a result of multiple intersectional aspects of their identity. This includes their legal involvement or prior legal history. It includes housing challenges, mental health and substance use diagnoses, and or race or ethnicity. And this often has the impact of ostracizing these veterans from the very support networks that can help them address PTSD, substance use disorder, and other core psychosocial needs. <clears throat> so a particularly insidious aspect of this stigmatization when it's experienced from others is that it tends to become internalized and engenders a sense of shame and hopelessness about recovery that can interfere with the veteran's participation in treatment, whether through the VA or as part of the treatment court process. 
And of course, as we'll talk a little bit later when we talk about treatment, um, negative thought patterns, hopelessness and shame can also all be a part of one's response to a traumatic exposure. So these issues then are really a paramount concern for us at VA and hopefully all of you on the call um, uh, as treatment providers and other, other folks who are involved in supporting veterans in the criminal justice system. Since legal involvement and these subsequent risk factors is also highly correlated with both attempted and completed suicides, overdoses, both fatal and non-fatal, and homelessness. These risks are particularly prominent at transition times out of jail and prison, um, but they're also related to stressful moments within the criminal justice system like court dates. So if we're not addressing the core treatment needs of veterans who are going through a system and not understanding how their involvement in the system itself may exacerbate these treatment needs, we really increase the risk of these, these negative and life-threatening outcomes, including housing, overdose, and suicide. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Dr. Chard now. Um, we can talk about how we address some of the clinical needs um, of veterans with PTSD and substance use disorders as a way of beginning to treat veterans where they're at and hopefully reduce the risk of these other negative and life-threatening outcomes and promote a sense of recovery and resilience in the face of PTSD and substance use disorders. Thank you so much, Dr. Stimmel, and thank you all for having me. I'm going to subtitle this presentation, Myth Busting About PTSD and SUD, if you don't mind, because I think there's so many assumptions that we make in the field about things related to PTSD and substance use, and maybe we can clarify a few of those today. So let's just jump right on in and talk about the current trends, morphing off of what Dr. Stimmel just left off with. And what I like to have us think about is when we think about what's the best treatment, I always like to say, well, what treatment and delivered by, you know, who and how are we going to deliver it and under what circumstances are the most effective for a person? And I think these are the questions that we ask about anyone going in from oncology, cancer treatment to a knee replacement to even PTSD in a substance use disordered population. We really need, can't think of it as a one size fits all because we know that that's just not the case. So let's talk a little bit more about how we know that. So there are clinical practice guidelines of du jour across the board from you know, the, the England guidelines, the Australian guidelines, the Institute of Medicine guidelines, and of course, APA, and then the VA DOD guideline, which a new version of which just came out last month, they give clinician guidance, but I find that a lot of clinicians don't even know that these exist. Um, most particularly the VA DOD guideline, which are designed to, to disseminate the information from research in a very palatable way so that you don't have to go and read all the research articles um, and assume that you know what the best treatments are that are out there. And I see a lot of practitioners talking about their therapy as evidence-based when it actually doesn't meet the criteria very clearly outlined as an evidence-based treatment in the guidelines. So let's talk a little bit about what the guidelines actually say is evidence-based for PTSD and PTSD related to SUD. So the first thing is, is that trauma-focused treatments work. And I think a lot of people get worried about trauma-focused therapy because they're worried that patients can't handle it. And so I want to highlight that when we do not treat PTSD we know that the long-standing impacts of having post-traumatic stress disorder can Im dramatically impact health, including higher rates of um, cystitis, colitis, irritable bowel, heart disease, cancer, stroke, on and on and on, and enjoyment of life. And we see a much higher suicide rate in individuals who have a PTSD diagnosis than those that do not. And with no treatment, we find that symptoms are very unlikely to get better and, in fact, typically get worse. And so myth busting, it's not coming and laying on a couch, going on indefinitely and having to talk about what happens to you. It, it doesn't mean you have to go to a group and tell a group what happened to you. But we know that there are several recommended therapies, not just for PTSD, but also for those with comorbid symptoms like depression and substance use. There are side effects to many of the medications out there, and a lot of these have symptoms that actually may worsen initially. And we know that in most cases, that the side effects of the medication often cause people to stop taking the medications and the medications tend to be less effective than the psychotherapies. So let's look at that, oops, sorry, I went a little too fast in a little bit more detail. The recommendation across the board has been that trauma-focused therapies in a very specific area, which I show on the next slide, have tended to be more effective than the medications that are most heavily supported for PTSD. And that within the medications, the SSRIs and SNRIs 
are the most supported um, with things like then the vaccine and um, Selexa, Lexapro tending to be at the top of the list um, for the treatment of PTSD symptoms, but we really don't have a medication that actually treats PTSD as a whole. And that is why the trauma-focused therapies have been found typically to do better than the medications. But if we're thinking about the non-trauma-focused therapies, which I'll mention in a minute, they do about as well as the medications. And so really thinking about the idea of offering trauma-focused treatments at the top of the list whenever possible. Now that said, what do we mean by that? What we find is that the research again and again and again for the VA, the DOD, for um, the Bureau of Prisons, for jails, for foreign countries comes back to the same evidence over and over again that prolonged exposure, CPT and EMDR, right, all tend to do well. So PE, prolonged exposure, CPT, cognitive processing therapy, and the eye movement desensitization, reprocessing and EMDR tend to work very well. The one caveat I will say to this is that EMDR has never had a strong study done in the VA DOD. That study has launched and is actually being done right now, um, nor has it had a solid head-to-head -head against PE or CPT um, that was powered for enough effect size difference. And so we do have these top three with that one minor footnote for EMDR. Beyond that, though, if a patient is not able to access these treatments or doesn't want those treatments, we do have other trauma-focused therapies that do have some solid data, just not as much, like written exposure therapy, brief eclectic, um, even present-centered therapy for PTSD has very solid data as a non-trauma-focused therapy. So the point being is that we do have a lot of treatment options, and I think what happens is a lot of clients say, I don't want to do you know, work where I have to talk about what happened, or I don't like doing the hand movements of EMDR, or I don't like doing homework. And the point being that all of these therapies are completely different from one another. So I always think about the, you know, analogy of outflanking PTSD, of giving treatment options to our clients that they'll take. And so really letting them choose which is the treatment that I like the best, that I would like to use myself, and letting them choose from a well-educated treatment standpoint of which of these suit me the best, right? So if we think about, you know, moving forward, that's still four treatments we're putting on the platter and then several more right behind as treatment options into the future, okay? So when we think about the therapies, I just, for the sake of convenience, highlighted cognitive processing therapy. The first thing I always think about is, okay, well, what does the research show? Can it be done in individual? Can it be done daily even with our new mast or intensive treatments where daily treatment is an option? Um, can it be done in a group setting? Can it be done in a residential treatment facility? So all of those come to mind. And it's, has it been researched in those environments to show that it works effectively? So in this case, CPT has been shown to be effective across all of those with interestingly, you hear a little bit of myth busting, um, doing it in mast treatment where we do it daily is actually showing a lower dropout rate than our other options and even some higher effect sizes, which is really, really important. Um, so someone asked Rick is branching, can EMDR work without replacing the memory? Um, doesn't it set up for spontaneous recovery of the traumatic experiences? I think one of the things that we know is that different patients respond differently because of the biological model of PTSD. And so what I always say is whichever treatment is going to allow them to reset the way the brain is working, you know, activating that prefrontal cortex and calming down that amygdala, that hyperactivity of fight, flight, freeze is what's going to work best. And our mythology really came from the idea of that people had to talk about what happened either in an oral fashion or they had to write about it or they had to imagine it. And we really know that that's just not the case. We now have found that it's patient choice. For some patients, never talking in great detail about what happened is more important and really focusing more on the meaning that they've made of it instead of holding that image in their brain or writing or talking about it. So again, some of those myths that even I perpetuated as a college professor for many years was this idea of you've got to get people ready to talk about it, to deal with it. And it's just not true. So we come back then to our slide here under what circumstances, you know, can we do things on the telephone? Can we do them on Wi-Fi? Can we do them in their own native language? Has this therapy even been translated into their native language? I know we just talked about the fact that we have a lot of Spanish speaking clients in our prison system. And so can it work in Spanish, for instance? Can it work with an interpreter? 
So, and what about for whom? You know, thinking about all the different types of traumas that come in to our facilities, the different types of people, whether it be an adolescent incarcerated individual or, you know, even children, where, where are we talking about the efficacy? And can it work for the different types of mood disorders and substance use disorders that go on with that PTSD. And so again, I outline just for CPT that these are all the things that CPT has looked at, but you would want to know this for any therapy that you were thinking about doing is where was its efficacy across the board? And that's what we mean by an efficacy or evidence-based treatment is that all of these things have been looked at. Now, the guideline goes on to say is that if trauma focused in an individual format is not readily available, then we have the medications and we have other therapies out there that are still better than using our supportive or mindfulness or other types of therapies. Now, we're not throwing those out with the bathwater, right? We're not saying that mindfulness is bad or supportive is bad. It's just that they will not have the same level of efficacy. And remember what I said, by whom, under what conditions will we have the best outcomes? And I always think about, you know, how much improvement will this therapy make, right? How fast will it make it and how long will it last? So it's not that any of the other treatments are bad. It's just that they don't have that same efficacy that these do. And we're offering them in a step down comparison from one to the next to the next, right? So if we then keep going on down, what we see, oh, it's morphing on me a little bit too fast. What we see is then most people tend to feel better over 80% by using the trauma-focused treatments. Most people do. They tend to have pretty significant improvements, um, some with the SSRIs and then less with the novel treatments. And then this slide takes you through some of the risks that we see. And as you can see, the side effects from medications are much higher and even from some of the novel treatments. And that will keep people from wanting to go into those therapies a lot of times. So what we wanna do is then look at the studies that back some of these up. So when we think about some of the new and experimental things that I had just highlighted, I wanna talk about some of these and where the evidence is in terms of how effective they are and how much research is currently going on. So to start off with, there's probably a fair amount of noise in this idea of wilderness therapies or essential oils or dietary supplements. You know, none of these things have been found to actually have a strong treatment for PTSD. Now, if someone still likes hiking in the woods, I want them to do that. That is a good thing. I'm just not gonna use that as my PTSD treatment, right? When we think about some of the things like animal therapies, equine therapies, service animals, we know that they probably have some help. We know that a lot of veterans report being able to get out when they have a service dog, that it helps them deal with being in public and things like that. Doing equine therapy helps them get in contact with a larger animal that tends to need them and rely upon them. But again, none of these have been found to actually be effective at treating PTSD. So could they be an adjunctive to a treatment program? Absolutely. We just wouldn't want to consider these to be the main treatment program when we're thinking about our veterans or our individuals with PTSD and SUD. Ketamine is unclear. I can tell you there's recent research that's just now coming out that is not showing much of an impact, including using ketamine even in the emergency room right after a traumatic event occurs. There was hope that it would actually prevent the consolidation of the memory and prevent PTSD doesn't look like that data is actually going to hold as well either. So it's too early to tell, but um, the signal is actually getting weaker and weaker for, for ketamine. Now, the ones that have some signal include TMS, stellar ganglion block, and psychedelics-assisted therapies. But again, there are problems across the board with all these in terms of the studies that have been done so far. So it's not a point where I would say I would choose any of these over the main therapies I just talked about. These are things that you would consider if the other therapies are not working or there is no access to them. You know, there's some um, knowledge that cell ganglion block is leading to people having great reductions, but they're only lasting nine months. So again, what did I say? How fast, how much, and how long? And if you knew you had to go in for a procedure that can lead to severe adverse events, potentially every nine months to a year, do you want to keep doing that? Well, the answer may be yes, if that's the only thing that worked for you. So really not thinking of this as a one size fits all, but thinking of this as giving treatment options to the individuals that are out there and really talking about them in depth, in depth, including the side effects and the risks with everything they have going on, right? 
So the thing I want to add in here at this point is the fact that PTSD typically presents with other comorbidities. And I think this is one of the things that gets people off track the most. We see most of our patients coming into the VA, to prison systems with multiple diagnoses, including most of the time three or more diagnoses. That means we're seeing them coming with, with depression, with anxiety, with some other type of mood disorder, with some other type of panic, and substance use or dependence disorders. So for people to say, oh, well, when you have substance use, that's totally different, it's actually quite normal. It's very normal for us who do PTSD work to find that this is something that commonly, commonly comes in. And we've known this dating even back to Carrie Kessler's great work from the 1990s and 2000s, but we never thought to do something differently with it. And so what we always thought was we had to treat the substance use, right, before we treated PTSD. And I don't know those of you out there on the call, I'd love to hear you weigh in on this. I was always taught substance use first, no matter what. And it didn't matter whether it was a panic patient, PTSD, depression, it was substance use first. And it's almost like the SUD people had a corner of the market on patients, regardless of other mood disorders. And we never questioned it, did we? I was like, I'm not a PTSD, I'm a PTSD expert, I'm not an SUD expert. So we just went with this as the rule of the road. And when the idea in the 1990s and 2000s got introduced of there being a self-medicating hypothesis, we just kind of went, oh, no, can't possibly be true. And I was chatting with colleagues before this call on the fact that we know that some people eat too much when they have PTSD. We know that some people cut when they have PTSD. We know that some people do other things to manage their symptoms. Why couldn't they also be drinking? Why couldn't they also be using you know, meth or heroin to manage? And so I think it's really important to notice that we found when we actually began looking at this even more, that when you treat substance dependence and do not address the PTSD, the patients actually do worse. We are doing more harm than good. The likelihood of a larger relapse when we don't treat the PTSD and the likelihood of an accidental overdose are much higher when we force people into SUD treatments and do not acknowledge the PTSD and either start the PTSD treatment concurrently or start the PTSD treatment first if they don't need detox due to potential withdrawal, right? And so I think we can remember at this point that alcohol use is very negatively reinforcing, right? And so it leads to a reduction in anxiety, which increases drinking. And I could insert many other substances in the same sentence, can't I, right? There are so many substances that our clients and veterans tend to use because they tend to handle the PTSD symptoms for them. They tend to reduce these other problems for them. But at the same time, the symptoms come back, which actually causes us to increase using the substances when those symptoms come back. And that presents quite a problem for us over the long term. So one of the things I want to highlight is the fact that we can use a lot of different options for assessing and treating the alcohol and other substance use problems that we see. There are a ton of measures that are now supported by lots and lots of mental health guidelines, including things that are very quick, like the CAGE, the audit, which is very quick and recommended by the World Health Organization. Um, there's the alcohol dependence scale. There's the DIS for both alcohol and other types of substance use, the comprehensive drinking profile. And many of these have substance use versions as well, not just, right? Not just an alcohol use module. So really looking at these and someone once asked me, well, would you still use these even if they were incarcerated? Yes, because a lot of these talk about behaviors that are causing them to use their substances that are often related to their PTSD symptoms. And it can really help set you up for success by understanding why they're using, even if they're not using currently, because they're currently incarcerated and really helping to understand that I can set them up for more success by finding out what their triggers for use are that are actually being caused by the PTSD treatment, right? By the PTSD treatment. So what we can do is really get into the therapies more effectively. So how do we then handle 
someone who's coming in with substance use that maybe does not need emergency detox, right? That maybe does have the ability to start therapy. And, and dare I say it, that we could actually put them on outpatient detox and start trauma therapy the same day that we don't have to wait for established sobriety before we can start treatment because that's where everything is moving into. With the idea that a therapist can use the tools from the evidence-based treatments to help manage the substance use. And what we find is that when we get in sooner with our PTSD treatments, are you ready for this? Substance use goes down almost immediately. I'm not saying they don't relapse. I'm not saying they don't still use. I'm not saying some of my clients don't become social users of whatever substance they choose, but they're not using the substance to manage their PTSD symptoms and to avoid. And that's a huge difference, an absolute huge difference, right? So what can we do? Well, we can contract with them to stop use. Or how about this one? Surprise, surprise, minimize use. Or in the case of what I recommend to my clients, to not use in response to traumatic cues or in response to session or in response to doing homework outside of session, right? We can actually give a treatment rationale that explains the avoidance behavior behind use. And we can help them think about, okay, what's the short-term gain? Well, symptom relief. But what's the long-term consequence of continuing to stay in that pattern of use? And maybe we could consider changing and finding that by changing will actually lead to better outcomes in the long run, right? A lot of patients will say to us, I can't stop using because then the memories will come back and the memories will never leave. Well, what we can think about is the fact that the memories won't leave, but their impact on your life can be dramatically different. So here's another myth bust. We know that a lot of people suffer from traumatic events. It's not as many as those who don't, but we know a lot of people do. But regardless of the traumatic events, typically only about 20% develop PTSD. About 80% of people recover from traumatic events. So one of the things we need to always keep in our mind is how do I help this person who's part of the 20% recover? And how do I think about the fact that they're using alcohol or other substances what are the things that they're telling themselves that make them think there's no other way out? So here's where we use things like Socratic questioning, just questions that don't have answers to them other than inside the client, where I don't have a preset script, where I can use these questions to help look at the cost benefit of maintaining their current substance use beliefs. Like, I can't cope if I don't drink. I can't cope if I don't smoke. I can't cope if I'm not high. I can't handle remembering what happened to me. I have to drink or use to make the memories go away. Or I'm garbage because of the things I've done when I was drunk. So therefore, drinking is bad, but I can't stop because the alcohol or the crack helps me handle the PTSD. And so often what they'll talk about is that the substances they're using help them sleep at night, manage the memories, and not feel like they're a horrible person. And all of these are part of the main constellation of PTSD symptoms. And so we really need to think about why are they using and not just how they feel bad for using, right? We can also think about scheduled use. I mean, I have clients where I say it can no longer be a bedtime ritual that using to fall asleep, using as a medication for a sleep aid is not appropriate. But if you feel like you still want to use, I'm not here to preach sobriety unless that's something you want and need. I'm here to preach appropriate use, not to manage your PTSD symptoms, All right? So again, what we can think about is if they're using throughout PTSD treatment, and the VA made a huge change a number of years ago where many residential treatment programs would send a veteran out of the program for PTSD if they used. So if they got a hold of a substance while they were in the residential program or while they were on pass, if they came back intoxicated, they'd be kicked out of the program. 
the VA made a substantial change a number of years ago where we mandated that there had to be a significant reason for discharge from residential PTSD programs, and a single use was not a significant reason. And I so appreciated this change because I know that so many people have issues when they're coming back. And those issues extend, as Kenya just said, far beyond just the PTSD and the substance use, right? We know that people have depression and they have all of these other symptoms. And so beating them up because it's hard to do treatment, or maybe they got a bad phone call, or maybe they had a horrible memory, that's the wrong thing to do. It's to really think about what caused that relapse, right? Help problem solve what can I do when I experience those thoughts, those feelings, right? When I have those moments, those phone calls, knowing their relapse history is incredibly helpful. What caused you to relapse in the past? Are there actually triggers that we can find, right? Look for how much urge surfing that they're doing and avoid cues that would cause them to want to use. All of these that can be really helpful things to incorporate into a PTSD residential outpatient uh, PRP day treatment type program to help them. And then instead of punishing people for relapses and saying, you're not ready for trauma treatment, again, maybe a lapse isn't a relapse, right? And maybe thinking of a total uh, abstinence program isn't really a good idea for all people. There may be some people for whom abstinence is an answer, but there are many, many people for whom appropriate use is a much more therapeutically appropriate goal, right? And then using concurrent options. Stop thinking about this as they have to reach X point in sobriety before we can allow them to move forward into their PTSD, depression, and other treatments. But instead, think about how can I set them up for success with both of these, knowing that when we treat PTSD, substance use goes down. But when we treat substance use, neither one tends to improve. And really, how can we then set them up for more success of maybe leaning a little bit further into that PTSD treatment and then adding on substance use help while and when we need to. The point being that the PTSD treatments that we all have found to be evidence-based help with not only the PTSD, but the co-occurring symptoms like depression, like anxiety, like substance use, so that we can really look at the whole person the absolute whole person. And as Dr. Stimmel pointed out on one of his last slides, you know, one of the things that we see with a lot of patients who have substance use and PTSD is this sense of, you know, I don't belong. I'm not worth it. I can't get better. We know that that sense of burdensomeness is one of the biggest predictors of suicide we have in our substance using PTSD patients. And handling burdensomeness is one of the key parts of effective PTSD treatments which is why we now know that in some of the PTSD treatments, we see suicidal thought and intent go down after the first session of evidence-based treatment, which really suggests we need to be leaning in more and more to these evidence-based therapies because they help reduce use and reduce the potential for suicide in our patients. So a few final thoughts on the topic I want us to think about then is I want to think about probabilities. There isn't a one size fits best. There isn't a one size fits all, definitely. There's really this idea of which therapy will the client be most likely to engage in. So I do think about it as selling them the options, not selling them an option. I'm selling them on the idea of getting better, that you can get better from all of these different symptoms you're having, all of these different disorder constellations you're having. And it's really a return on investment. If you use the evidence-based treatments, you'll have a better outcome, faster, more improvement that lasts longer, right? So I think in terms of better or worse, so I really think in terms of, you know, which of these will work better? Which of these will work worse? Because clients don't often understand words like effective or ineffective. And that's really black and white. Which one is better for you? which one is worse for you. All treatments have limitations, right? You're gonna have to do homework in some of them. You're gonna have to imagine things in some of them. You're gonna have to retell some of them. Medications have side effects. 
Sale ganglion block has side effects. So really helping the client think about what are the limitations or side effects. Because folks, if it sounds too good to be true, nighttime television, I'm selling you a product, it probably is. We do not have a single therapy out there that works for everybody. And I see all too often people selling these new interventions that they say will work for everything, including your eating disorder and your tooth decay all at the same time. And it's just not the case. We just don't have evidence that any of the therapies will work for all people all of the time. So most treatments will help few, but few treatments, just few treatments will help most. So the point being doing something is better than nothing. We know if we do something to help our clients, it's better than just sitting them alone. We know they will tend to get worse. But if we can focus in on getting more and more people trained in the main evidence-based treatments like cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure, even EMDR, we know that we can influence things to have more of our clients getting better. Because the truth is the VA has done some pretty significant work that shows when we park people in treatment readiness, when we park people in um, skills-based and mindfulness and education groups, they tend to get worse. They tend to have higher rates of suicide and they tend not to engage in evidence-based treatments afterwards. So we really need to think about moving forward with why aren't we using the evidence-based therapy? What are the myths associated with them? And how can we help them in this particular population? Because the evidence-based treatments have that lower risk of suicide and more reduction in substance use over any other treatment options that we have, right? And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this back over to Dr. Simmel, who's got some great um, assets for us to share. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Char. I really appreciate it. And one of the, you know, best things about this experience and presenting um, with colleagues like you is just, you know, obviously we've reviewed each other's slides and preparing and all this stuff, but in listening, all these other ideas are stimulated and, and thinking about. And so I'm just going to name a couple that popped out to me as you were talking that I think I'll come back to as I, as I go through the rest of my presentation, but want to name them from just because they're so important. Um, the first is just that where you started, which is what are we delivering? Who is delivering it? Um, what circumstances um, and will it be effective just speaks to the kind of individualized nature of treatment. Um, and what I'm going to hope to do with the rest of the slides here is talk about everything that Dr. Char just described in terms of treatment and map that from the kind of clinical treatment setting into justice system and particularly thinking about it in terms of courts, but, um, but I think it can um, be applied in other settings as well. So that individualized thought, is to think about PTSD and substance use disorder as an incredibly heterogeneous presentation of the symptoms, right? I think there are 24 potential symptoms if you go through all of the criteria in a DSM-5 diagnosis of PTSD, and this is just some combination of those 24. So you can think about all the permutations of what might show up for any individual in your courtroom. Um, so if you're thinking about given person-centered, veteran-centric care, you really got to tailor the individual treatment plan to that uh, individual veteran who's in your court, and you've got to trust clinicians and experts like Dr. Charge who are working with them on what might be most beneficial to them with their input. They are an important piece of this uh, treatment development, uh, treatment plan development process. Um, and that speaks to another really key issue, which is sometimes harder to embed in justice settings, which is harm reduction and understanding that use, um, continued use isn't necessarily, um, you know, a result of being, uh, sort of obstructive to the recovery, but rather a part of what they're experiencing as they go through the court process. Um, so think about harm reduction as I go through the next few slides. Um, and then the last thing you just said about being a burden um, and the suicide risk just really struck me because I think unfortunately all too often the systems can respond to individuals and veterans with mental health and substance disorder treatment needs as, as a burden and not understand that actually system involvement is an incredible burden to the individual. Now, and I understand people make choices and engage in behaviors that um, need to be addressed and sometimes need to be addressed throughout the legal system. But A, a lot of times it, maybe we can deflect them into care earlier before getting them caught up in the system. And B, even if that's the case, that there needs to be a, a sort of justice or oversight response, um, understanding how engaging someone in the justice system might add to their level of burdensomeness feelings is really important as we're thinking about trauma-informed care in those settings. 
So that's just a little like use simulator for me, Dr. Char, to appreciate that. Um, and I'll come back to it um, throughout. And before jumping into a little bit more of this kind of mapping the clinical presentation onto the justice side, just some good news from some research that I did a couple of years ago with our colleague, Dr. Finlay, that really looked at this question about whether or not having a co-occurring substance use disorder had an impact on, on veterans who had legal involvement about whether or not they received PTSD treatment. So at the time, we looked at all um, veterans served by veterans justice outreach specialists. Um, this is, again, the, the paper came out a few years ago, so it was on data from veterans between 2010 and 2014. Um, we looked at all veterans who VJO specialists served who had a PTSD diagnosis, and that was about 27,600 veterans. Um, and about 27% of those veterans had a PTSD diagnosis with no co-occurring substance use disorder. But as we just heard, it's not surprising to hear that the vast majority, 73%, um, who had PTSD and legal involvement also had a co-occurring SUD disorder. Um, and what, what we saw, which was great, is that um, having co-occurring SUD actually facilitated access to care. Um, so those who were at most high risk, meaning they had other mental health comorbidities in addition to PTSD, they had housing instability or were homeless, they had combat exposure, they were more likely to get PTSD treatment. And then importantly for purposes of our discussion, those who had the co-occurring PTSD substance use disorder diagnoses had higher odds of getting PTSD treatment. So um, on the VA side, um, we saw that co-occurring SUD is not a barrier to care, um, uh, which is great. Um, and that's sort of what we'd like to see um, based on the evidence that Dr. Char just presented, which is we don't want uh, substance use to be a barrier to access to care for post-traumatic stress disorder treatment. So that's on our side of the house, on the VA side of the house. Um, uh, and that's really what VJ Veterans Justice Programs are designed to do, facilitate that access to care, um, which can serve as a protective factor against all those risks I went over at the beginning. And again, I'm not going to do a deep dive in what our programs do. I really encourage you to listen to that earlier webinar um, uh, by my colleagues from a couple of weeks ago. Um, but our specialists, I just want to name, are situated across the criminal justice spectrum. So wh whatever setting you're in on this call, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's crisis interventions, whether it's treatment in the community, or it's jails or prisons or courts, um, there's a Veterans Justice Outreach Specialist or a VJP or HCRV Specialist um, we, so we're in over 2,000 jails, um, work with over 600 courts and over 1,000 prisons. And uh, last fiscal year, we served almost 40,000 veterans. So there is um, support for linkage to the care that we're talking about. So let's talk about trauma-informed care then in these settings. And again, I'm going to focus a little bit more heavily on treatment courts because um, I think of all the systems that has a little bit more flexibility than um, a jail or prison setting. Um, but I think what I'm going to talk about hopefully can resonate even if that's the setting that you're calling in from. And so what I want to highlight, and this comes straight from SAMHSA, is that trauma-informed care is a framework, um, and it can be applied in almost any settings, even those that have historically been insensitive to the issues related to trauma and PTSD, or at times have maybe exacerbated them. Because trauma-informed care focuses on understanding and responding to signs and symptoms of trauma, as well as building a, an environment um, that's uh, safe and empowering for individuals going through that system. So basically, put simply, it's a human response to a very human experience. Um, and I know a lot of us work in systems that often don't feel too humanizing, and it's really our job, it's incumbent on all of us to make it more so, and trauma-informed care provides a framework in order for us to do so. <clears throat> so how do we do that? So let's just take a second to, uh, you know, I, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar on the call with veteran treatment courts, so I'll just go over really briefly on um, what they are, and that, that is their structured, supportive, collaborative court programs that often include peer mentorship, veteran peer mentorship as a core component of the treatment core team, and are really designed to assist veterans get access to treatment instead of following a kind of path towards incarceration. And since we're talking about how to apply trauma-informed care in a relatively structured environment, it's really important that we conceptualize this approach as starting at the top. So that means getting treatment core judges to buy into trauma-informed care is paramount, which can then drive the kinds of training educational opportunities for the rest of the treatment core team. Uh, and that, in turn, can drive training and educational opportunities for other treatment court judges and other counties that are start thinking about starting a treatment court, as well as other community justice partners. Um, in fact, when I, so I was a BJO specialist myself in Northern California for several years and helped start um, several treatment courts, but also worked in several more well-established treatment courts. And whenever I was starting a court, I tried to get those newer courts to observe one of my more established courts so they could see how an effective court worked. At All Rise, um, that's the, the new name for uh, the, formerly, uh, the organization formerly known as National Association of Drug Court Professionals, or NADCP. So All Rise and Justice for Vets, um, their veteran treatment court specific um, sub-organization of All Rise, um, actually identify mentor courts in the community who do great 
work um, often are trauma informed, uh, often apply the gold standards of treatments of both PTSD and other uh, co-occurring disorders like opioid use disorder and making sure that medications are available for those disorders as well. Um, they identify mentor courts and they invite newer treatment court teams or just those who want training to do virtual visits of those courts. So this is an opportunity again to share education and information about how to become trauma informed. Um, I'm talking about this coming from the top down. It can also equally come from the bottom up. Obviously you need um, higher level leadership to buy in, but a lot of that buy can come from observing those of us on the front line doing this work, responding to veterans going through our court systems or our jail systems or prison systems with that more trauma-informed veteran-specific um, uh, care. Um, so if we model uh, trauma-informed principles in the work that we're doing and in how we talk about that work in our treatment court settings, that can help sway and, and I think uh, lead to buy-in from those in leadership if they're gonna be resistant to trying to em embrace trauma-informed principles. And so I wanna talk now about another framework that's often used in justice settings that I think actually really maps well onto this trauma-informed care framework perspective. Um, and that's the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the risks, needs, responsivity framework. Um, and again, I won't go into depth. That's not the focus of this training. Um, uh, many of you may be familiar with it. Um, some of you may not, um, please check it out. R&R &R, as it's often uh, referred to in shorthand. Um, but really it just rests on a pretty simple principle, which is we wanna match the level, the appropriate level of intervention to um, whether, and whether that intervention is supervisory in terms of justice, you know, sort of justice system uh, oversight of, a, of an individual on probation or in jail or prison um, or clinical in terms of the kinds of treatment we're offering them. We wanna match their level of risk and need um, to the care that we offer them. Um, and we don't wanna um, sort of inundate someone who's low risk, low need with a ton of things to do um, and a ton of oversight because actually increases their risk of recidivism. We really wanna match um, uh, the level of need to the level of care. <clears throat> and uh, I'll rise is very clear on this. It's pretty well established um, that treatment courts are really designed to address high risk and high need individuals. That said, uh, we know that many courts do have additional tracks for lower risk and lower need profiles, and that's totally fine. Um, we understand you're gonna serve who's in your community. But what I wanna highlight is that whatever group of participants you are serving in your court, it's actually possible to conceptualize some of the core components of this risk need responsibility framework through a trauma-informed lens which is what I've done in this table here. So the column on the left describes the kind of, what's called the central eight criminogenic needs. The middle column provides uh, examples of how these needs might manifest behaviorally um, for someone who's going through the court process or maybe their behavior in the community prior to coming to court, what maybe led them to get in trouble. And then the column on the right describes how these might map onto symptoms of PTSD and trauma exposure. And so if we actually start in the middle with a behavioral manifestation, um, we could see how easily we could jump to a description of that behavior on the left that is more focused on problematic thinking or behavioral outcomes that potentially is a more stigmatizing way of understanding the behavior. Or we can think about it from a more trauma-informed perspective, um, which is thinking about how do these behaviors relate and map onto um, symptoms and experiences of PTSD, including substance use. And so that's what this next slide goes into a little bit more detail here, um, sort of some of the ways that these symptoms commonly come up for veterans going through the court. Again, this is just you know some, some quick examples. There are lots of ways that this can manifest because PTSD and co-occurring substance use disorders are such a heterogeneous clinical presentation. Um, I'm just gonna give some light examples, but of course um, there are other ways this can manifest. Um, so one of the biggest features of PTSD, and of course, to be honest, um, really most of all of our responses to painful emotional experience, whether it's depression or anxiety, or even just stress is avoidance. We don't like to feel painful, negative uh, internal emotional experience. And so we avoid in a lot of ways and how this might show up for veterans in treatment court settings is through things like missing court dates or appointments with the probation officers, skipping treatment sessions, <clears throat> giving up or expressing homelessness, oh, sorry, hopelessness. And it's easy to understand how all of these things can create fear in an individual with PTSD. Perhaps they're afraid treatment will require them to go into significant detail about the trauma before they're ready, right? Dr. Chard was talking about that, of really thinking about what's the individual preference. Do they have to recount their trauma? Do they have to write about it or talk about it? And the answer is no. Um, with an informed assessment, um, there are lots of treatment options available um, that can assist them, and it's really important to listen to them. But they might be afraid that's what's going to happen in treatment. You're going to make me talk about this thing right off the bat when I'm not ready to do it, and that's scary, so they skip their treatment appointments. Showing up to a, a, a probation office uh, where you know you're going to be tested or showing up to court where you know there's going to be a review of your treatment progress can be really stressful, especially since historically 
uh, if someone has had prior legal involvement before being in a treatment court, which many of our treatment court participants have had, their experience with probation or in the court system has not been supportive. And so even though you might be a really supportive collaborative team, their prior history of having really uh, negative outcomes when they show up to court or they show up to other legal system uh, appointments uh, might drive their avoidance currently. Um, uh, and in fact, there's some research to suggest that stressful events in the legal system, I had mentioned this a little bit earlier, things like court dates, when there's a lot of uncertainty about what's gonna happen and you don't know, especially if you've been struggling, um, how that's gonna be represented in court and how the judge or the court team might respond, that really increases risk um, of a lot of things, including potential uh, increased suicidal ideation. Return to use um, and, and, and lapses, as, as Dr. Chard mentioned, you know, this can signal a lot of different things and it doesn't necessarily mean you know, what we start we think of as a, a full relapse um, or it doesn't mean they're not trying to engage in treatment or trying to do well in court um, and in their recovery. It just is a very common part of the recovery process and a very common part of, of, of one's kind of progress through treatment. Um, so instead of criminalizing it or punishing it, right, so Dr. Charles was talking about in the clinical sense, you know, sort of not kicking someone out of a treatment program just because they might have had a, a return to use of some kind, we can think about the exact same thing in a court setting, which is not kicking someone out of court, not uh, doing a flash incarceration, uh, maybe not even a sanction, but rather thinking about how can, respond, how can we respond to this behavior with compassion and understanding about what might be driving the return to use. Um, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, that could be something like coping with uh, an anniversary of a traumatic event, a stressful relationship issue at home, um, or just in general communicating some kind of distress that's going on. So how can we as a system be more responsive in a therapeutic and trauma-informed way rather than punishing the behavior? And we could say the same exact thing about external, externalizing behaviors we often see in court that are listed here. Um, all of these things also, I won't go through each of these, but you can just see how um, behavior can often respond to internal experience that's related to trauma and manifests itself in substance use or other kinds of co-occurring problems. And all of these things can also tie back to the idea of stigmatization, which I keep coming back to because it's something we see again and again in the veterans with whom we work. And I want to be clear, this they experience stigmatization not just in justice system, but they also experience in healthcare settings, including at times at VA. So none of us is free of the potential impact of implicit bias or just how we think about people when we hear certain aspects of their past. And so stigmatization is a core part of this experience for veterans who are going through the justice system. Um, and it can exist outside of the veteran's own awareness. And again, sort of be internalized and reinforce, reinforce a feeling of not being wanted, not being deserving, and therefore not engaging in the very things that can help them rebuild their lives, including all the support available to them in a treatment court. So the take home is that all of these things interact and there's never one, just one cause for any one behavior, um, which is why understanding and recognizing trauma signs and symptoms can help us respond with more compassion. And for those of us who haven't had legal system involvement, it's really hard to understand just how stressful that experience can be, even in a treatment court setting, because it's not only rife with uncertainty um, and potentially really negative outcomes if you quote unquote kind of fail a treatment court, right? A lot of times a sentence is kind of hanging over someone's head. So that pressure um, to perform and engage in treatment um, can be be a lot and so there's a lot of stress there um, it also creates return to this idea of burdensomeness a lot of complications in someone's life um, someone who wants to get back to work someone who's trying to improve relationships with their family these court obligations can create barriers to that and while it's really important to engage in treatment and show up and follow through on all of your court obligations it's really important for the court team to be aware of how that might interact with these other issues and stressors going on in someone's life so we can be responsive to them and help them meet all of their needs not just their court responsibilities so um, as such, I included this slide. This is actually from another presentation more geared towards treatment providers at the VA to sort of think about what might come up for veterans when they're doing clinical work with them who have PTSD, but also legal involvement. <clears throat> because I think the same exact principles and warnings can apply to the court team. Namely, the importance of taking a beat to understand what is happening if challenges are arising for veterans in your court maybe pausing uh, intensive treatment requirements or readjusting a treatment plan to see a vet what a veteran may need um, at a given court session, depending on what's coming up for them in their lives at that time. Using the education and training and trauma-informed care, whether through webinars like this one or other SAMHSA games resources or other VA resources, which we'll share in just a minute, um, and sort of uh, using that education to talk in these person-centered trauma-informed ways non-stigmatizing ways about what's going on and how it relates to the broader challenges that may have brought that individual to the court. 
And generally speaking, that the more you use this approach, the more you return to these trauma-informed principles, the more trust and safety you'll build with your participants, which will then in turn empower them to re-engage in treatment in a meaningful way, to understand that having a slip is not going to be punished, that talking, talking about why they're struggling is not going to be punished, but rather held and supported by the treatment support team. Uh, I'm going to stop there. Um, I just want to be mindful of time, and I could speak all day, as I'm sure Dr. Chard could, about all the different ways to conceptualize this work. Um, so I just want you to want to uh, end with bringing it back to something I said earlier, um, which is that we all work in systems. And you know, I was talking about court, again, that can be a lot more um, uh, flexible in some ways than, say, a jail or prison settings. And I know um, I saw some folks saying that are coming from departments of corrections. Um, but again, we as individuals, we're the people staffing all of the programs in these settings. So even if the setting, even the system seems really inflexible and rigid, and there are ways, and the VA is at times a very inflexible, rigid system, there are still ways that people within those systems can help shape the response that we give to those being served by those systems. Um, so for all of us, for those of us who are showing up every day to do this work, we can be the drivers of change, and it just takes um, sort of thinking about people from this compassionate, trauma-informed lens to help drive that change. So um, that's it for our overall slides. I do want to mention we have a bunch of resources listed here. I'm not going to go through them all because um, they're all in the handouts and you'll get this after the presentation. Um, but you'll see many of them as you click through. There are links for everything here. And basically, they're all different kinds of resources. Everyone learns in different ways. So these might apply differently to you, um, depending on what um, is most useful to you. I, I encourage you to check them all out. But different ways and different resources most of which are developed by the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, um, which is sort of the main research um, advocacy and policy arm of the VA that focuses on PTSD. So there are links to all of these there, um, including a, actually a really cool um, uh, PTSD uh, military veterans toolkit for police officers. We're talking about how to keep folks out of the justice system. It's a big focus of what we're doing in BJP these days is thinking about how to prevent folks from getting into jail and courts, et cetera. So we have a toolkit here um, that focuses on that. And then, of course, there are lots of resources from SAMHSA as well. So please, when you get a chance, scroll through, check them out, and you can reach out to us with uh, any questions about the resources. Um, but with that, I'll stop there to make sure we have uh, time for questions um, on today's presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Simmel and Dr. Chard, for your presentations. And um, what a wonderful uh, very rich uh, conversation. And uh, here is, a, for those of you who joined after I did my opening remarks, um, we will send out slides to anyone who registered for this webinar. We'll also notify you when the recording is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. So you will get the slides with these tip sheets and uh, resources and, and, uh, and all of this information. So um, just stay tuned for that. And um, there are a few questions that have come up around accessing uh, supports for people who might be interfacing with the criminal legal system. There's a court uh, question about veterans courts. And uh, we did talk uh, quite a bit about supporting veterans that are interfacing with the criminal legal system, um, supporting veterans through veterans treatment courts uh, as part of our part one to this webinar series. And uh, you will see a link for that dropped in the chat. Uh, it's under Erica Ihara. And so uh, for those of you with those types of questions, I really encourage you to check out that recording because there's so much information there about access, accessing um, your veterans justice outreach specialists um, and inter interconnecting with veterans treatment courts in your communities. So um, just a really great resource there. Wanted to make sure folks know about that. We also um, welcome you to submit questions in the Q&A portal uh, now. And I would say this is um, the fewest questions I've ever received on a, uh, a webinar. So um, obviously, Dr. Chard and Dr. Stowell know how to just answer all of your questions preemptively. And, and so um, we don't have very many in uh, the Q&A portal. So folks, if you have other questions, please do drop those into the Q&A portal. Um, I did just get one from um, Mr. Ferrario, uh, and uh, this person said, you have talked about harm reduction and controlled use as a way to support the client's own goals. How do you implement harm reduction in a legal correctional system that seems unsupportive and unforgiving of a lapse or return to use? And so um, you know, maybe uh, 
Kate or Dr. Chard, I'll start with you. And then I'd like to also get your input, uh, Matthew, Dr. Simmel. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So I, I think there are ways to do um, harm reduction in a variety of ways because you're exactly right. There are a lot of different ways that systems in general, whether it be the legal correctional system or if you're at home and you're not happy at home or you're being abused or assaulted in your home or if you're getting a lot of negative reactivity because you're a veteran and maybe your family doesn't understand what you went through. Um, you know, why aren't you getting back to work? Why do you have problems reacting to society? Why can't you go to the family reunion? Why can't you take me to dinner? There are a lot of um, systems that are very unsupportive and potentially unforgiving of relapse. You know, you, you never go to work. You never show up. You don't show up sober. So I think you're exactly right. There are a ton of variables that we have to think about. And I think the first one is always education really educating our colleagues who work in correctional settings about this. And I think this is where the judges and the vet courts and the, the VJO specialists can really do a lot of work and have done amazing work to really change things. I mean, Little Old Cincinnati had the second misdemeanor court in the nation and then I think had one of the first felony courts. And the judges have just been exceptional about insisting that people who come in front of their courts are educated, not just the veterans, but that the people who are in the court room touching these patients are educated about risk and resilience. And so I think it's really important that we bring information like this, that we put this link into people's hands where we can talk a little bit about harm reduction and things that you can do to actually create a more supportive environment and not just a punishing environment, but also leaning more into the PTSD. You know, we talk so much about don't use, don't use, don't use, but we don't talk about replacing that with something more effective, like how about we use PTSD interventions, you know, that have the depression and the anxiety and the burden cyst components in them to reduce use. And so I think it's twofold. It's really both, right? Sorry, um, I'd agree with all of that. I'm sorry to be on mute. A um, hundred percent. And I think, you know, the, the, there are a couple of additional things to say. One is um, co treatment courts have a lot of leeway in how they respond to these issues. Um, and All Rise and Justice for Vets is pretty clear about being clear on graduated sanctions and making sure that if you're going to sanction someone, it, it kind of corresponds to the infraction. And I think substance use can be conceived of different ways in terms of how that might fit in a, in a kind of a sanction incentive grid. Um, and so uh, the court team and the judge has a lot of discretion to think about how they want to uh, how they want to conceptualize return to use. Um, I think it's also really important to be uh, one of the wonderful things about being on Treatment Court team is you get to work with so many people with different kinds of experience and professional backgrounds, as well as different clients with all different types of experience. But it's really important to understand where the expertise is in each of those domain on the team. And, and treatment core teams that I think are the most effective are those that really integrate clini the clinician on the team or the social worker. It might be someone from the community. It was often the veteran justice outreach specialist who's relaying information from VA providers, but using that clinical um, information to help drive how we respond to these issues and not just responding with the kind of traditional criminal justice approach. So I think there's a lot of room on court teams to be more flexible around harm reduction and understand if a lapse happens where does it fit kind of in the in the sanctions grid for that particular court team? Um, why is it happening? Getting input and, and kind of feedback from the clinical team so that the court team can come up with a sense of what's the best response in any given indication. Um, and, you know, I think one last thing I'd also say, because jail, it is harder in jail to have harm reduction model. You know, obviously it's illegal to be doing drugs in jails and prisons, but we know they're there. Um, you know, people still continue to use, and that's a trickier thing, of course. Um, but I think you know, as an example of how to think about being more flexible around harm reduction in carceral settings is a lot of jails and a lot of prisons don't offer things like medications for opioid use disorder, despite that being such a critical gold standard intervention for that condition. And in fact, you know, I worked with a jail that had a residential treatment program kind of as a subsection of the jail, but you couldn't go to that treatment program if you were on methadone. Um, and so here you are saying, you know, we want to treat substance use, but you can't actually be on medications for opioid disorder to get into this program. And so things like that are a way where jail think about harm reduction, even if the jail doesn't want to really buy into the idea of MAT or MOUD, you know, a harm reduction model is allowing individuals who need medication to still engage in the full treatment component. Um, the last thing I'd say related to this, which I think also relates to one of the questions in the Q&A that we didn't answer yet, um, 
around why there's not a more standardized approach to um, to veterans courts. Um, a, I, I wish I had a great answer for that. There's not a good one. <laughs> um, these are um, locally run programs. Um, and as much as I know All Rise and Justice for Vets tries really hard and does a wonderful job of setting out what the 10 core components are for these courts, offering free training, having really clear guidelines and best practice standards, ultimately it comes down to any given community and judge in terms of how they shape their court program. So that's not ideal. Um, but how this relates to risk and harm reduction, all these things is actually the best way to make a treatment court program or intervention in jail work is not to get someone into the program to begin with. And if there's lots of early intervention deflection programs that exist for that exact reason, uh, John, you mentioned a veteran who might have PTSD, who's a first time offender and might be lower risk, lower need, and shouldn't really necessarily be in a treatment court because of that, but doesn't have another option once they're booked or arrested in the court system and they get a record, that's a terrible outcome in either direction. So the ideal outcome in those cases is when they are contacted by law enforcement, and we know most people who wind up in jail in the court system have like seven or eight contacts with law enforcement before they're actually booked, arrested, and brought in, is with that early contact, having the law enforcement or first responder, whoever's working with that veteran, be able to identify, ask a question whether or not they're a veteran, and divert and deflect them to care. And there's actually an awesome program in Cincinnati, speaking of where you're at, Kate, um, called the Military Liaison Group, where the Cincinnati Police Department has a wonderful relationship with the Veterans Justice Outreach Specialist. Um, they conduct warm handoffs all the time. The police officers are trained to ask about veteran status. They have a core of veteran officers on their team that go meet with that veteran to talk to them. They'll take them to the VA, kind of demystify, um, demythologize some of the problems that often folks have about the VA, and then hand them off in a warm way, either to an emergency room provider or to um, the veteran justice outreach specialist to ensure that continuity of care so that a veteran who is maybe entering the system for the first time doesn't even enter the system and they get straight into care. And I think that's the best form of harm reduction intervention we can do is is preventing that contact in the first place. And I just want to add that uh, Erica Ihara just dropped into the chat a link to a recent webinar that we did with the Game Center did with All Rise, uh, formerly known as the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. Uh, and they spoke on uh, the harm reduction practices that they uh, advocate to incorporate in treatment courts. and. So uh, a really helpful uh, webinar there as it is applicable to veteran treatment courts. And um, so more on harm reduction practices via that webinar. Um, and I, I do see that uh, there have been a couple of questions about treatment modalities. And so um, I just maybe want to revisit those. I know they were answered in writing, but maybe just to give uh, Dr. Chard another chance to kind of just uh, reiterate some some of her recommendations around treatment modalities. So there was a question about ART and whether that's being used as well as is uh, DBT an effective treatment for this population. And um, so we know that those are some common um, treatment modalities. And so um, Dr. Chart, I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of reiterate what you wrote and add to that anything else, any other takeaways that you think the audience should, should remember in terms of these modalities and, and what's really effective for folks with PTSD. I appreciate it, thank you. And so just to highlight um, the importance of knowing the difference between evidence-based and something that's just being used and talked about. And I see people, um, you know, tout their treatment as being evidence-based when maybe they did a pilot study on 10 people. And we know that, again, treatments by and large work, just talking to people work. But I'm going to come back to my main point. It's really about the difference between those and your significant outcomes. Just to highlight this, we know that the evidence-based treatments last 10 years later. There's now been more than one study that shows when we treat PTSD, even with co-occurring other disorders, that 10 years later, people are still better. So the bottom line is PTSD is treatable. It's not about maintenance, which is what we used to talk about in the veterans, in the prison system. It was about how do you manage your symptoms? How do you live with the memories? Let's remind ourselves that firefighters go out and suffer from traumas all the time. They have to recover or they can't continue being a firefighter. There are people who are on active duty for years and years. They have to find a way to manage these symptoms. How do they do that in a way that isn't just managing with drinking or with um, substance use? How are they doing it? Well, what we know is that when you process a memory and put it away, it is just a memory. 
all that may be sad or may be happy, but it is a memory and it doesn't have to control how you're feeling now, what you're thinking about now. And so the big thing to remember then is that we've got the main treatments in CPT and prolonged exposure and EMDR. And then we have other therapies that are also somewhat effective, but maybe not as effective. And then we have a whole slew of therapies that maybe just have one study, maybe only have a couple of pilot studies where they actually haven't been shown to be as effective. So we really shouldn't be leading those. So ART, which is accelerated resolution therapy, has not been tested as significantly as the other treatments. It is a subset of EMDR. The first big trial of it, comparing it to one of the evidence-based therapies is actually being published right now. But a presentation on it last fall showed that ART had a 70% dropout rate. And again, if a therapy isn't tolerable or clients don't like it, then how useful is it? Because we don't want clients dropping out from treatments. Another therapy that was asked about is dialectical behavior therapy or DBT. Now, DBT was not created to be a PTSD treatment. It was created to be a treatment for personality disorders like borderline personality disorder, but it's also very effective for other personality symptoms as well. I can tell you that for clients who don't have good regulation, affect regulation, DBT is a great therapy. It can be done in small amounts prior to starting active trauma treatments. It can be incorporated into residential programs, but it will not actually treat the PTSD symptoms, right? And then finally, I wanna highlight, a lot of people ask me about other treatments like seeking safety, because that is known to be a PTSD sub treatment, but I wanna highlight the truth about this therapy. It's not a PTSD treatment. It's a sub treatment for PTSD patients. However, unfortunately, it doesn't have any better outcomes than relapse prevention and other SUD treatments. So it can be used in a SUD program. It's just not going to treat the PTSD symptoms. And as we know, we've got to get in there and treat those PTSD symptoms to help reduce our SUD symptoms. It's critical because the outcomes, if we don't, are increased use and increased risk, risk of accidental overdose. And of course, not treating PTSD leads to increased risk of suicide. So it's really incumbent upon us all to really do good diagnostic assessments and see if we can make these PTSD programs available to our veterans and patients, regardless of where we're treating them. Thank you for that, Matthew. Is there anything you would like to add to that? Uh, I know better than to try to add to Dr. Chart on any <laughs> evidence-based treatment-related content, so I'll, I'll leave it there. But I, I did see um, another question that I'm happy to respond to in the chat that came in about treatment courts, if that's all right. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, Nicole, I see your question about uh, supporting service members who are not veterans because they haven't had an active service, like guard and reservists. Um, and this, this gets back to John's question about why there's not a more standardized approach. Um, and, and here's where this is both can be both a good and bad thing. In some sense, um, it's a good thing because courts get to determine their own eligibility criteria by and large. There are certainly some state statutes and some states have statutes that dictate um, who can be in a treatment court and, and why. Um, uh, but even those often have some latitude that judges can use. Um, uh, and, and in a lot of states where there's not a statute, it's really up to the treatment court presiding judge to decide who might be eligible. Um, and as an example, one of the courts I worked with, which is an early one, had an incredibly inclusive judge um, that would allow um, anyone with any kind of military service in their background, including uh, guards, people, and reservists, um, whether or not they were activated. Um, and so uh, this is a place where you on the call, if this is a, a, a gap you're noticing in support is to, to advocate, um, you know, if you know a treatment court in your community um, that doesn't um, allow veterans uh, or individuals who serve but aren't quote unquote Veterans, and I put that in quotes only because, unfortunately, the definition of veteran is very complicated um, and is set by Congress and is not, uh, you know, in our mind, when we ask people to identify veterans, we try to use as broad a uh, brush as possible as saying, have you ever served in the U.S. military? List out all the branches, list out guard, list out reserves to have as wide a net as possible to understand what services may exist. Um, and so it's worth asking and seeing if you're a treatment provider, whatever your role is in your community that, that's aware of these services, might the judge, might the treatment court team, consider being more expansive. And this ties back to something I said early on about veterans with other than honorable discharges. 
who also, depending on the definition, have historically been excluded from VA services. So VA is doing a much better job, finally, long overdue, of expanding access to care for veterans with other than honorable discharges, especially around mental health crises, but also for diagnoses that may have been an onset during service or after service. Um, and I won't get all the eligibility issues here, but there is expansive care. But historically, service members um, have been excluded from treatment courts, sometimes because they can't get VA care. And in most cases, someone in the guard and who's a reservist who hasn't been activated, who hasn't been deployed, is likely maybe not to be eligible for VA health care. It's still worth enrolling and finding out. But in that case, sometimes treatment court judges have said, you know, we can't offer them VA health care, so we don't want to bring them into the court because otherwise, how can we serve them? And I think that, you know, unfortunately, is a very limited view of how to best serve veterans in the community and that really um, cultivating community resources and bringing in uh, uh, places like vet centers, um, other community providers who can serve those veterans who might not get VA health care is really important because we want to be inclusive in terms of how we think about service. Um, and it's not that individual's fault that they weren't activated. Um, they still signed up to volunteer knowing that that was a risk. Um, and it, I think is, you know, incumbent on the community to hopefully try to serve them as best they can. Thank you so much for that. Kate, was there anything you would like to add to that? No, I think, um, you know, in terms of that topic, again, I'm going to definitely let um, Matt take, take lead on that since he knows so much more than I can speak so much more eloquently. I think just in final closing thoughts, I, I do want to highlight that there are so many resources out there. And so if you feel like you're alone in the wilderness or that your site isn't using some of these or isn't keeping up with this evidence that you're hearing us talk about, please reach out. Reach out to some of the wonderful guidelines that Sam says posting out there, some of the links that Matthew put on the um, slides, you know, and also reach out to us. I know, you know, Dr. Stimmel and I are always happy to talk with you all about any of the things that we've talked about, but really helping veterans, helping incarcerated individuals, helping people with PTSD, I could go on and on and on, right? Um, get the care that we know that they need, they know that they deserve, and we know will change the outcomes for the future is really what's most important. And so what, whatever we can do to help facilitate changing the culture, even in your own site, we would absolutely be happy to help with. So just believe that culture change is possible. It's just, you know, one step at a time. Yeah, I, I just want to echo that. Uh, we're always available. Uh, I, we in the VJP office could not be more proud of our specialists out there. They do incredible work in all of these settings um, and they're there to help. We're, we're happy connected to them. We also really proud that we know most of them really well. <laughs> and so it's very easy for us to make those linkages. Um, uh, and with that mind of sort of systems change over time, uh, I also put in a link, not just to where you can find your VGO specialist, but where you can find lists of free legal pro bono legal clinics, as well as uh, uh, legal organizations that have recently been awarded grants um, from the VA to provide civil legal services that can often help um, address some of these other needs besides criminal legal needs that veterans may have. Um, so please check those out. That idea of giving money for pro bono legal services was one that uh, we've been talking about for years and years and years. And finally, Congress passed the law that allowed us to give um, two different kinds of grants. I think that was discussed in the first presentation as well. So change does happen with your advocacy, with your efforts. Um, uh, it can happen, and we're here to help support that. So again, yeah, please reach out anytime. Thank you both for that. And uh, so someone did ask about trauma training for their veteran treatment court uh, team members. and. So I did drop in the chat a, a link for trauma trainers that have been trained through Samson's Gain Center on a trauma training for criminal justice professionals. However, this is a training appropriate for anyone, uh, behavioral health, criminal justice, uh, park, uh, park rangers, uh, really anyone that's interacting with folks that may or, uh, be coming in or out of the criminal legal system. Um, so this trauma training is a four hour training to give folks a, a, a really high level overview of what trauma is and um, some, some really basic uh, approaches and responses that can help keep people with trauma uh, calm, um, can help keep situations more de-escalated. Uh, so really advise you to look at that trauma training uh, link there in the chat you can find people who've been trained in by state. So you can look and click on this your state and find a whole list of folks that have been trained that reside in your state. Uh, if you're interested, 
Also, watch out for an opportunity from the Game Center. We will be soliciting for communities that would like to train folks in their community to be trauma training trainers. We'll be um, notifying you about an opportunity opportunity to apply for that training this coming fall. So uh, stay tuned uh, to the Game Center's listserv, and I'll give you some information about connecting with that. But next, I'll just change slides to go to the uh, certificate of webinar attendance. So if you will just check the chat, Ashley Sabatino dropped a PDF in the chat. You can click it and then your computer will prompt you to download that to your computer and you will fill in the information there. Uh, and thanks Ashley, she just put it in the chat again. Next slide, please. And we also just had a closing poll pop up if you'd like to provide some feedback. And then here, if you have not registered for SAMHSA's uh, list, the Game Centers will serve. Here's a condensed URL. You can also scan this QR code. And then Ashley also just dropped that URL in the chat. So uh, trying to make it as easy as possible for those of you who haven't signed up for the listserv. And this is where we notify you about upcoming trauma trainings, um, webinars, and other resources around these, these topics. So um, be sure to sign up there if you haven't had a chance to already. And next slide. So here, if you like uh, Dr. Chard and Dr. Simmel said, please reach out if you have any other questions. The Game Center's website and direct phone number is listed at the bottom of this slide. And we welcome you to reach out to us with any questions you may have. Um, and I just want to say before we hop off, thank you so much to Dr. Chard and Dr. Simmel for these, uh, the wealth of information you've provided today. It's been uh, so informational and helpful. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much. Have a great day. All right. You too. Everyone have a great evening. Bye. Goodbye.